Stop wasting your marketing money and systematically grow your business. Hi, this is Tim Francis from Tim Francis Marketing, and I'm hoping in this presentation that I'm able to give you at least three good ideas. How important are ideas in business? Well, truly they are wealth. For example, once upon a time, oil was just a black, strange, thick substance in the earth. And then someone came along and they said, I'm gonna give it an idea. We're gonna pull it out of the ground, and then other people came along and said, let's put it into computer chips and cars, and now we have so many of the modern conveniences that we have today because of oil. Now, is it really oil, or is it the idea that we gave oil? It really is the idea that is at the heart of everything. And I'm hoping in this presentation to give you at least one really good idea in the area of sales funnel, which I'll explain more in a moment. Secondly, in customer relationship management, and thirdly, in something that's called the marketing water wheel. If you've never heard of that before, you will learn about it today. So let's get started, and hopefully we'll find at least three good ideas for you in your business today. First of all, let's talk about the sales funnel. I'm assuming you're probably familiar with it. In case you're not, or you wanna show this presentation to someone who isn't, this is a sales funnel. There's you and your business. You've got certain bills you need to pay, and you also wanna make some profit in your business, so you need customers, and you need those customers to be in a great enough number that you're able to make the money that you need. So your job is to convert them into profit for you. Now, you need enough prospects because not all prospects become customers. You need more prospects than customers and you need to convert those prospects to customers. Now, prospect is someone that I would consider someone who's checked out a sales meeting, has checked out a sales page, they've demonstrated some pretty serious interest in what you're doing. Now, to have enough prospects, you're gonna need enough leads and you need more leads than prospects because not all leads become prospects. And your job is to convert them. I consider a lead to be anyone who is in your database. You've got their name, email, phone number, mailing address, something like that, some contact information that you can be in touch with them about different sales promotions that you've got going on. And lastly, you need enough traffic and you need more traffic than leads because not all traffic becomes leads. Traffic I consider to be anything anyone that comes to your website, that walks into your store if you've got one, is in the audience at a presentation that you give, anyone who calls into your business. So basically, anyone who's in touch with your business somehow, that's traffic. And your job is to convert them to getting into your database somehow, so that ideally they then become a prospect by seeing a sales presentation of some kind, and then eventually they buy something and they become a customer. So this, this whole marketing strategy I'm about to share with you is based on two key principles. And marketing really at the end of the day is about exposure, having enough exposure to each of the different levels. And then from there, converting each level from one step to the next so someone can ideally make it the whole way through. So where do things fall apart in the sales funnel? Well, there's many different places it can fall apart. And if you actually take your own sales funnel and you break it into these individual parts and you look at how things are going, I think you might find some huge opportunities. So let's look at some possibilities here. What are some reasons that someone might be in touch with your business at the traffic level, but not actually enter your database at the lead level? Well, the most common reason that you will lose money, bleed, hemorrhage people and, and marketing dollars like crazy is if you don't offer people an opportunity to join your database, then they won't. So for example, if someone calls into your business and they ask, about some products you have for sale, but you never offer them to join your database, well then that's a pretty unfortunate situation. You've just wasted that opportunity. If someone comes to your website and there's no web form for them to put their name and email address in, well then it's gonna be pretty tough for them to join your database. Second reason is maybe the offer that you're giving people to join your database is not interesting, exciting, compelling. So oftentimes on a website we'll see something like, uh, join my newsletter. Well, everyone's doing that. It's kind of like the realtor that says, hey, free market evaluation. The reality is everyone's doing it and it's not really that exciting. Julie, a client of mine said, hey, if you join my database, I will send you something called 300 deals, how I did it. It's a bi-weekly video lesson on lessons I learned from doing my first 300 real estate transactions. That is way more compelling. Likewise, if someone calls into a restaurant and you say, hey, 
I'd like you to join my list, they'll be, well, no, I'm not that interested in it. But if you say, join my birthday club, where you'll get a free meal on your birthday, well, hey, that's so much more compelling. Maybe the instructions are not clear and easy on how to join your database. So going back to the website example, maybe the web form that you've got to put name and email address into, maybe it's really far down on your website and people never see it because they never scroll down far enough to see it. So what are some reasons that people might become a lead but not actually check out a sales presentation, not actually become a prospect? Well, the first reason, and by far the most common, is you just didn't stay in touch. You neglected them. You forgot about them. People see 3,000 marketing messages per day. Over the course of a month, that's 90,000 marketing messages per month. If you don't stay in touch with someone, they will forget about you. Dan Kennedy, a renowned marketer, says that a list will generally lose about 10% of its value every month that it's ignored. And this is by far and away the biggest reason that people never actually engage with your business, never actually check out a sales presentation, is because they've just kind of forgotten about you. Secondly, it could be that the copy isn't compelling. So what do I mean by copy? Copy is the written words or the spoken words that you say when you're asking someone to check out a sales presentation. So if you say, hey, come to this sales pitch, that's not as interesting as saying, hi, I've got a, um, a meeting coming up where I'm gonna share the 10 ways that you can save $10,000 in 10 days or less on your next real estate purchase. That is way more compelling as a title than, hey, come to my sales pitch. So your copy needs to be compelling to get people to come out to a sales presentation, to look at a sales letter or anything else like that. The next reason that someone may not check out a sales presentation is you didn't stay in touch. <laughs> I'm mentioning this again because it's such a big deal. What you see here, this is a research that was done by a company called Infusionsoft and they looked at how many phone calls does it take to close a deal. The red bar at the top represents all companies that were willing to make one phone call to close a deal. And you can see that 48% of all the companies they, they surveyed were, were prepared and willing to make one phone call. However, only 2% of deals actually closed on that first phone call. If we look all the way at the bottom now, at the green bar at the bottom, you can see only 10% of companies were willing to make five or more phone calls and that's where 81% of deals closed was on the fifth phone call or later. Now maybe you use phone calls, maybe you use email marketing, maybe you use direct mail. There's lots of different ways you can stay in touch with people, but I think the principle here at the core of things is that it's gonna take repeated exposures to make most sales. Now what is a reason that someone may check out a sales presentation but not actually buy? Well. If they don't know, like, and trust you enough, they will not buy. Secondly, maybe your sales presentation was weak, and that can be related to the quality of your copywriting. Thirdly, maybe your prospect didn't have the five power disqualifiers. So I have to give credit to John Paul Mendoza. He's a sales trainer. Fantastic concept, this five power disqualifiers. So the first is money. Someone may not buy because they just didn't have the money. Secondly, maybe they don't buy into your USP, unique selling proposition, which is actually something we're going to talk about later. They didn't actually believe that you'd be able to deliver on it. Thirdly, they didn't have the authority to say yes. A lot of people have the authority to say no, um, but few people have the authority to say yes, and that's what you need for someone to buy. Fourthly, do you fit their overall plans? Maybe they love what you're doing. Maybe they've got the money. Maybe they really think that you can deliver on it, but they're going out of the country for six months and they're not going to be ready for, in, for another six months, so that's why they're not buying. The fifth power disqualifier is they don't have a bleeding neck. They're not motivated to, uh, to, to purchase. So maybe someone really has the money to buy a, a, an, ex, an extra property from you or to purchase some form of services that you offer, but it's not that pressing for them. But then after that, someone dies in their family and they go, oh my goodness, if I don't take advantage of this now, I will be leaving my um, family in a real pinch, or I will be not living my life's dream of owning a rental property in a tropical location or something like that. Now, what are some reasons why someone might buy once but not buy a second time? Well, the biggest reason of all is they weren't asked. 
And that's usually because you didn't stay in touch and you're too embarrassed to go back and, to someone and say, hey, I haven't talked to you for six months, but uh, you may not remember me, but um, maybe you don't know who I am, but you're right. Like that's a pretty awkward conversation to have. So by staying in touch with people, it makes it very easy to go back to people and ask them to purchase a second, third, fourth time. So by breaking down the sales funnel, we can actually establish percentages. So let's say you've got 5% that convert from traffic to leads, 5% leads to prospects, 30% prospects to sales, and 10% sales to repeat sales. Now what if you found a way with some of the ideas I've shared here or maybe other ideas to improve each step along the way just a little bit? So maybe this first step goes from 5% to 10%. Second step, 5% to 10%. Third step, 30% to 40%. Last step, 10% to 20%. So we're not talking about like crazy, crazy huge changes here, okay? Just five or 10% basically every time. So what's at stake if you're able to make those improvements? Well, let's take an example and let's say you've got 10,000 people that look at your website, call your business, walk through your location, whatever it is. You've got traffic of 10,000 people. Now we said you have a 5% conversion there, so that would be 500 people entering your database. And then 5% check out a sales presentation, so that would be 25 people. If you close 30%, then you would make 7.5 sales, and if you had 10% repeat customers, that would be 0.75 sales for total sales of eight people. Now maybe that sounds like an extremely low number, especially if you own a retail location where you're maybe making 30, 40 sales a day, maybe eight sounds low, but for someone who's raising money, for an investment, eight sales over a year could be a really big deal. That could be like a million dollars or something like that. So let's just work with this example and, and see it through. So we said that you might make just small improvements each step along the way. Lead capture improving by 5%. Sales presentations improving by 5%, then 10% and 10%. Is that a total improvement of 30%? Does that mean that we would go from eight sales plus 30% to 10.4 sales? Well, let's follow this through. Let's say we make these improvements. Even if you have the same traffic of 10,000 people, your lead capture at 10% would now actually be 1,000 people. You would now get 10% into sales presentations, which would represent 100 people. You would then sell 40%, which is 40 people. And then your repeat sales would be 20%, which is eight people. That means your total sales would be 48 total sales. Is that the 10.4 sales we maybe thought just a few moments ago? Absolutely not. And the reason is that you've actually doubled your lead capture, you've doubled your sales presentations, you've increased sales by a full third, and your repeat sales have doubled as well. So no wonder that the actual increase from eight to 48 sales represents a 500% increase. And that's what's at stake if you take the time to break down your sales funnel and find ways to tweak each part along the way. Now, this is a quick disclaimer about the marketing water wheel. I'm not saying that you are necessarily going to increase by 500% if you do the marketing water wheel or you improve your sales funnel. Okay, I'm not here to hype you up and promise you some incredible thing that I have no way of being sure is going to happen. A lot of this depends on your commitment and sticking with it, and also your market and the demand for what you're doing, the number of competitors you have, and any market factors that might affect you, okay? So what I can tell you is that the biggest point of failure that I see with clients when it comes to the marketing water wheel is actually that it's a battle of attrition. People oftentimes just give up before they've properly implemented the marketing water wheel. So usually you, you wanna be looking at minimum three months for basic items and probably six months to really start seeing some impact from setting up a marketing water wheel for yourself. Now before we go to the marketing water wheel, let's talk about the second area which is customer relationship. And why is it so important to create a customer relationship and what would that look like? Well, let's look at a, at a case study here. We've got two different real estate agents here and the one on the left, when you buy a house from her, you're gonna get a gift in the kitchen immediately upon possession. Then three days after possession, you're gonna get a courtesy call from her, just seeing how it's going, making sure that everything's going well. Then seven days after possession, you're gonna get a gift card for $100 of catering in case you wanna have a housewarming party. Then 10 days after possession, you'll receive by email a list of approved tradespeople from the area that are trusted by the realtor in case you want to make any fixes or improvements to the home. 
Then 20 days after possession, you're going to get a tip sheet on winterizing or maybe spring cleanup, whatever the case may be, because it's that time of year. Then 45 days after possession, you're going to get a customer satisfaction survey so that you get an opportunity to give honest feedback on how the realtor did and what your experience has been. Then during the holiday season, you're going to get a Christmas card or if it's the summer, maybe something in July to celebrate your national holiday. Then 70 days after possession, you get information about the referral program, about what advantages you might enjoy if you refer friends, family, and coworkers to the same realtor. Then on your birthday, you get a birthday card. That's definitely lots of fun. Then 120 days after possession, you actually get an email where the realtors pre prepared an annual forecast on housing prices so you can see where the value of your home is going in the upcoming year. Then 150 days after possession, you get an invitation to a free educational seminar on how you might be able to purchase that tropical property for when you're wanting to retire. Then after that, 185 days after possession, you get a surprise gift certificate for massage therapy, for a free massage with a local massage therapist. Now what you may not know is that the realtors actually negotiated a deal with that massage therapist and the massage therapist has said, yeah, you know what, I'm willing to give out a certain number of free massages because I know those people might become repeat customers at which point they're paying. So here this realtor has intelligently been able to give out all these free massage therapy gift certificates look like a super all-star to her list of customers and yet it didn't cost her anything to do that 12th step. So let's compare this experience of working with a realtor to this realtor on the right which is your typical realtor that leaves a gift in the kitchen on possession then seven days later gives you a courtesy call to make sure everything's okay. And thirdly, gives you a stupid ugly calendar during the holiday season with wildlife scenery. And after that, completely disappears and you never hear from them again until you get the next stupid ugly calendar at the next Christmas season that is wildlife scenes of the Rocky Mountains or something like that. So what's at stake by building this, this customer relationship? By going to the lengths of the realtor on the left versus the realtor on the right? Well, let's take a look. This is a concept called current bank versus future bank. And I got to give credit to Dan Kennedy for sharing this idea with me. So current bank would be things like money that you've got in your register, you've gotten savings. It's what you would normally think of as your bank account. What the future bank is, is what we're talking about here. Now the future bank represents profits that are sitting in your business in the future, yet just have not yet happened. And knowing that they're there is hugely important for you to plan your business moving forward and for so many other reasons. So what's, what's an example of future bank? Well, let's say you've got a restaurant and you've set up a birthday club where people who join the club get a gift certificate for a free meal on their birthday. And let's say that over time you've got 2,300 members in your birthday club and you'd be surprised how fast that can accumulate. And from there you've, discovered that about 70% of people will redeem that gift certificate for the free meal. So that means that you're having 1,610 redemptions per year. Now every time someone comes in, they actually bring three friends or family members, which is very normal. So there's actually still a $100 cash check that happens for that birthday meal. So that means every year there's 1,000, uh, sorry, $161,000 a year that comes in off this birthday club. And we know that the average customer lifespan is three years at this restaurant. So that means that this birthday club has a future bank value of $483,000. If you knew that kind of money was sitting in your business coming down the pipe in a, in a, in a way that you're quite confident that it's there, wouldn't that make a difference for you? Managing the future bank is all about managing, staying in touch, giving value to your list of customers and building and deepening that relationship over time consistently. So how much should you be in contact with people? Well, there's definitely a spectrum. So call that the quantity. And there's also the quality that you have to be thinking about. If you give people not enough contact and it's the wrong kind of contact, that's neglect. On the other hand, if you've got too much contact and it's the wrong kind, then you're going to annoy your people. So really it's about finding this happy medium where it's welcome, where you're helpful and interesting to them, and you're growing and deepening that relationship over time. That is healthy. So let's now talk about 
this third area where I'm hoping you'll get at least one really good idea from this presentation, and this is called the marketing water wheel. Now, it really all starts with your unique selling proposition or USP, and I'm almost positive you've probably heard of this concept before. It's what makes you stand apart from all the other businesses, from all the other competition in your market. Now, there's different ways you can come up with a USP. One is what you do. And especially if you're in a lower competition situation, say a small town, and you're only competing against other businesses in the area, if you're the only lawyer, then you don't have much competition. No one's gonna confuse you with the plumber or the mechanic, because what you do is you're a lawyer. Now, if it's getting a little bit more competitive and there's a few different lawyers in town, or maybe you're a, a yoga teacher or something else, then who you do it for becomes more important. So let's say you're the yoga teacher and you're in a, in a big city, and there's lots of other yoga teachers. Well, maybe you really specialize in being a yoga teacher for hockey players or football players. Maybe you become a yoga teacher for cancer patients and survivors. So who you do it for makes you unique. Next up, how you do it is in a sense kind of the next level where you can really start introducing say things like a guarantee that people will get a certain experience. So what are some examples of that? Well, some examples of how you do it type USPs, we can look to some classic examples. FedEx, the shipping company, billion dollar industry with very intense competition from UPS and United States Postal Service and Canada Post. Their USP was when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. So there, they said, okay, we're not gonna focus on five day shipping, we're not gonna focus on regular postal mail, we're focusing on parcels that without a doubt must be there overnight. And that's where they focused and they built their entire business around it. Another example is Domino's Pizza. How many pizza shops are there in a city? Tons. Yet Domino's Pizza literally has built a billion dollar business on this USP. Fresh, hot pizza delivered in 30 minutes or it's free. And there you see there's a guarantee in there. It's that the pizza is free if they don't meet their promise. A couple other examples, a real estate agent. How many real estate agents are in a city? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And they're all offering the same stuff. It's so crazy to see. What if when realtor said, our 20 step marketing system will sell your house in less than 45 days at full market value? That would be a stunning USP. What about a dentist? There's lots of dentists in, a, in any given city. What if someone said, we guarantee that you will have a comfortable experience and never have to wait more than 15 minutes or you will receive a free exam. So again, we've got a guarantee in there. Now the dentist can't guarantee what a real estate agent can. They can't say, oh, your house will sell at full market value. They can't guarantee that kind of thing, but they can guarantee the experience. It'll be comfortable, you won't have to wait too long, and then they guarantee it with the free exam. So let's now talk about the marketing water wheel. The USP is the first step in it. What is this marketing water wheel? Well, you can see an image of it to the right here, and I will show you a bigger image in just a moment. So it's a complete marketing system that takes care of the sales funnel and also takes care of the customer relationship part that we talked about earlier in this presentation. Now, how Tim Francis Marketing implements it and builds it for customers and clients, we have our own proprietary way where we actually include a lot of tracking of the most critical points to know where your conversions are really good and where they might be weak. Secondly, we can actually put a lot of it on autopilot for you. So if you remember that real estate agent that had all those different points of contact of email and uh, snail mail and phone calls, well, a lot of that, we can actually put that on autopilot for you so you don't have to do a lot of that manual labor. Also, we make sure that you become a welcome, trusted expert in your customer's mind. We also really pay attention to copywriting and, and how things are phrased so that you can have a really nice impact and you can really be helpful to your customer. Now the easiest way to look at the, the marketing water wheel is to look at case studies. And I'm gonna share three case studies for th the three main kinds of businesses that I've had experience with. So the first is a sales business. What do I mean by sales business? That's anything where a person is going out and selling, such as a real estate agent, such as someone who's selling life insurance, financial planner, an investor that's raising money for an investment. And in case that's 
what this person is doing. This is Julie. She's a client of mine. She's a real estate investor. She had completed 300, over 300 transactions. And she had taken, uh, she was involved actually with an apartment building that was changed to condos. And she was going to sell these condos as um, beginning real estate properties to first time real estate investors. So in, on top of that, she was not only going to sell the property, but she was also going to offer her coaching to these first time real estate investors so that they would know how to find tenants and know how to manage the property and everything like that. And she was really focusing on first time investors, primarily from the Alberta, Canada area. So that's her USP. The marketing hub, which is the orange circle with the number two, that was where she kept all of the information about her, um, sales information about the property she had for sale, lessons that she was giving to people, and all that was found on her website. And these days, a website is the key to pretty much any business as far as running a marketing water wheel and as far as running pretty much any kind of marketing campaign uh, these days. So next up, you can see, again, exposure and conversion. Exposure and conversion, that's such a huge part of marketing. Our first blue circle here, number three, says new leads. So at the top of her sales funnel, Julie needed to get new leads. And what she had done was she'd actually personally gone out and done a lot of networking. She went to real estate clubs and became a member. She went to real estate educational events and was a student alongside other real estate investors. She also went to professional networking events to meet people and to see who might be curious. Now, she did a lot of this before we started working together, but once we did start working together, we created her first conversion piece, which was an ethical bribe. And it was uh, uh, an educational series that went out every two weeks called 300 Deals, How I Did It. And it was actually a video series. And obviously, if someone's a first time real estate investor, that's who she was focusing on, that would be very interesting. Holy smokes, I've never done one deal. This woman's done 300 deals. I really think I could learn from her. So then from there, you can see there's exposure, 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 and that's the education that they get from getting the 300 deals video series. And then from there, at a point, at number five, we've got sales offer. So here we're looking to convert this person into a sale. And so Julie had on her website, we built a sales letter where people could learn about the properties, about the education that they would receive, and the support, the mentoring they would receive from her. Now, those people that knew, liked, and trusted her enough at that point and met the five power disqualifiers would go on to a sale. Those that did not, no problem at all. We're not here to sell when we're ready to sell. We're here to sell when someone is ready to buy. We don't want to be a pushy salesperson. We want to attract them to purchase from us. So they go into this right side of the marketing water wheel where they get more education, more interesting information, more nurturing over time from Julie. And you can see they'll go around and around and they'll get to know Julie more, like her more, trust her more over time. And a month from now or two months or three months or whatever, we will present them with another sales offer saying, hey, if you'd like to know more about these condominiums that we have available as first time investments, you can watch this video. And if you like what you see, give me a call and we will have a sales meeting. And at that point, if the person knows, likes and trusts Julie enough, and they've got the five power disqualifiers, they will move on to a sale. If not, no problem. They just keep going around this right side of the marketing water wheel. Now, when someone does buy, that gives us an opportunity to do a couple really cool things. First of all, we can get testimonials from the satisfied customer. And as you can see, that goes off to the left to the marketing hub because we can take those testimonials and we can put them on the website, on the sales page. We get a video testimonial and put that on the website too. And that just makes our marketing hub that much stronger and all of our marketing that follows. We also get an opportunity to do referrals. And you can see that when someone refers their friend, family member, coworkers, they can go right into the marketing water wheel. They can be converted with that 300 deals video series. So they, they begin the, the, the cycle of getting to know Julie and then they just continue on down this right side. Now, once someone has purchased, we don't, forget them. This is not one night stand business. Okay. The truth is it's actually six times less expensive to sell to someone you've already sold to than to try and go and find a new customer. So we're going to take that customer. We're going to put them into the left side of the marketing water wheel. And in this case, Julie has her monthly education and mentoring 
phone calls, one-on-one -on -one training with the new real estate investors so that they stay nice and close to Julie and there's a good chance that they might purchase again. So number seven, sales offer in the blue circle here. In six months from now or a year from now, maybe they'll know, like, and trust Julie enough and maybe they will have met the five power disqualifiers. Maybe they've saved up some more money or whatever and now they're ready to purchase again, which guess what? Now we're another opportunity for more referrals, another opportunity for more testimonials and the whole marketing water wheel actually feeds itself as things go around and around. In our next case study, we're gonna look at a very different kind of business. I'm gonna call this the info business. And oftentimes consulting, um, psychologists, therapists, um, uh, any kind of experts that sell their consulting um, could be on anything from management to marketing to cooking to teaching people how to do yoga. It could be any number of different uh, areas. They're all sharing information. Now, the, the example we're using here is actually a clinical hypnotherapist. His name's Travis, and he has an online business um, as well as an in-person business. So he sells things off his website as well as selling sessions and consultations one-on-one -on -one with people that want to stop smoking, lose weight, those kinds of things. So in this case, he's wanting to focus on an ebook that he's created. So it's an electronic product called Secrets of Slim. And it teaches the proper mindset for weight loss and offers mental exercises to be able to do it. So it's not diet, it's not exercise, it's the mental side of being able to lose weight. And who he's focused on is primarily women who are frustrated with yo-yo dieting and exercise and they're determined to figure out what subconscious blocks are holding them back from having success in losing those last 10 tricky pounds to lose. So if we look at the marketing water wheel, we've discussed his USP. His marketing hub is a website. He has a sales letter on there. He's got articles about weight loss as well as hypnotherapy and he has testimonials from clients. Now, the, the, the expo first exposure step, new leads. Here, he actually has really strong SEO, search engine optimization. When people go online and search for Edmonton weight loss, uh, Edmonton hypnotherapist, he comes up as being one of the top results that people can click on. Um, he's also used at different points something called Google AdWords. And he also uses Deal Find, Groupon, Team Buy, the different group buying sites to offer uh, really inexpensive introductory sessions for people to come in a group setting, usually 20 to 40 people, to come check him out. He shares some information about hypnosis and gives them a day full of training. They really appreciate that. They pay, I think, 20 or 30 bucks to be there, and then that can lead to everything else. The, his conversion piece, his ethical bribe, is a free chapter in his ebook. And the exposure that you can see is people receive that, and then they'll receive a few emails saying, um, if you've ever had a problem with this situation, we mention how to take care of that in the free chapter I just sent you. So it's those kinds of things. Then number five, we've got a sales offer. So he'll send them an invitation to check out his sales page to actually purchase the ebook. If they know, like, and trust him enough and they meet the five power disqualifiers, they will go on and purchase. If not, no problem. They go into the right side of the marketing water wheel where they will get the opportunity to know, like, and trust Travis more and more and more through more and, ex more and more exposure. And what does that exposure look like? Maybe he sends them inspirational videos of people who've had success losing weight and keeping it off. Maybe he has extra information on his interpretation of fad diets that he hears about. Maybe there's a book that came out that was really pop popular on Oprah and Dr. Phil talking about weight loss and maybe he's gonna do a critique of that. So he's, it's all relevant value added lessons and information and inspiration, education in this right side of the, the, of the marketing water wheel. So at some point they'll get another sales offer. If they don't buy, no problem, they just keep going around and around. If they do buy, it's because they know like and trust them enough, they've got the five power disqualifiers, they come through to the middle and there is a sale. Then from there, just like with our last case study, there's an opportunity for referrals to get more people into the water wheel. There's also an opportunity for testimonials to strengthen all the different marketing materials. Then from there, they go into the left side of the marketing water wheel where Travis will offer a 12 week accountability course where people can take what they learn in the book and they, for 12 weeks, they can be a part of a, a group of people that meet once a week led by Travis and they go through the book one week at a time. And that's an opportunity for him to make another sale, make more money. 
And if not, no problem. He'll just continue sending more articles, education, inspiration, inspiration to them to keep in touch with them over time. Maybe in the future they will want to do something like a 12-week course. So that is our second case study. Our third case study is retail. So we're literally going to talk about a brick and mortar store. And in this case, it's a hat store. Now this hat store is located in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and they focus on selling fancy hats to people who want to look fashionable and or stand out from the crowd. They are here for Edmontonians and people for the most part in most of Alberta if they want to, to purchase a hat and have it shipped to them. And here's where things get a little bit more advanced and you can see how things can really develop. Headcase actually has four primary customer segments. There's the 18 to 25 year old newbie girl and what we mean by that is someone who's new to wearing hats. They don't really know what hat goes with what outfit, they don't know the different names of the hats. All they know is maybe they saw in the royal wedding of, of Kate to William that she had a really amazing hat or during her tour through Canada she had all these different hats that were so cool and now she's interested how she could maybe get involved with the same stuff. Second segment is an 18 to 25 year old newbie guy. So again, this is a guy who doesn't know about hats, just knows that he saw maybe someone in a band wear it that really, really liked it. And so that's the second segment. Third segment is a 35 to 55 year old veteran woman. This is a woman who already owns hats. She already knows how to mix and match her hats with different outfits. She knows what they're called. She knows how to travel with them when she goes to other cities and countries. The fourth person is a 35 to 55 year old veteran man. He has hats, they're part of his day-to-day -day life, part of his regular um, outfit. And for him, he knows what the hats are called, uh, he knows how to wear it, he knows how to size it properly on his head. He might be interested though in how do I clean this thing from home, okay? So again, we start with the USP. Now because we have four different market segments, we actually kind of have four different USPs. The reason that someone may want to buy if they are the uh, the newbie woman, the 18 to 35 year old newbie woman, might be very different than the 35 to 55 year old man. Okay, so we just have to be very conscientious of when that is present. The marketing hub is the website again. There's no problem here because we know that the website is expandable. We can put infinite numbers of different videos and articles on there for each of the four different segments. So that's perfectly fine. And then from there on the, the website itself, we'll make sure that the opt-in form we put on has an option to join one of the four different lists. Now, number three, exposure. Headcase Hats has been very, very successful in actually getting free publicity from the media. And so a big, a big media like the Edmonton Journal and Global News has, during Fashion Week, gone to Headcase Hats and said, you know, what's big in fashion for this upcoming year? And that's led to a lot of traffic to their website. Now, where Headcase Hats has had problems in the past, and I'm working on this with them right now, is how do they convert that website traffic into people in their database? And again, that's just a matter of developing and promoting that ethical bribe right on the website, asking everyone who walks into the store if they'd like the ethical bribe, um, everybody who calls in if they'd like the ethical bribe. So for example, if the 35 to 55 year old man comes into the store looking at hats, we can offer him something that's unique to him. And so for him, it's called um, the hat care kit. It includes a free steaming of the hat and a, and a $10 gift certificate for, the, for their next purchase. It includes a video series on how to clean your own hat at home using a steamer. And, it, and it'll also probably include information on how to buy a hat for your wife or significant other. And so you can see that the, that ethical bribe is very specific to that one segment. And because it's so um, specific to them, they can go, wow, yeah, that really does sound interesting to me. We don't have to distract them or bore them with stuff that's unrelevant. So they'll get that exposure, they'll get the, the guide on how to clean the hat and all the rest, and then periodically we'll make a sales offer to them. And, and truly we'll do this with all four segments. And there'll be four different sales offers because we have four different lists of people segmented into our four different segments. And so the, the, the uh, 35 to 55 year old gentleman, he'll receive the information related to him. He'll also re receive a sales offer related to him. So at Christmas, he'll receive an offer that maybe says, would you like to buy your wife a hat? Would you like to buy 
um, this specific kind of hat that can keep your head warm as you walk and are shoveling the driveway or doing something like that. Okay, and then we'll have different sales offers for the three other segments as well. So same idea, if they don't buy, no problem, they just keep going around the marketing water wheel. If they do, they end up in the middle here, they make a sale, they can provide referrals to friends, family members, and coworkers. They can provide testimonials for a marketing hub. And then they go into this other marketing water wheel where we continue to build the relationship deeper and stronger. We make more sales offers and hopefully they end up purchasing more in the future. So I hope within this presentation, you've gotten at least one really good idea in our three different areas, uh, in the sales funnel component of the presentation, in the area of customer relationships, and then thirdly, in the marketing water wheel. If you're curious to get more information on this or anything to do with marketing, I encourage you to come to timfrancismarketing.com. I've written lots of articles, we're putting up some videos, lots of ideas and resources for you to be able to take your business to the next level and truly stop burning and wasting money and opportunity like so many businesses do. Be a part of the 1% that are intelligent and deliberate about their marketing and leave the other 99% in your dust. Thank you so much for watching. It's been a pleasure to be with you here today and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you very much.